Good evening, everyone. Welcome to day two of our adult vacation Bible school class. Tonight's presentation will come from our own minister, John Lowry. He will be discussing the encounter with Jesus on the water, coming from Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. Be sure to take notes for our Q&A session on Friday. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening. Good evening and welcome to our second evening of Vacation Bible School. Uh, my name is Minister John Lowry and I am um, delighted to be with you here this evening. Um, I thank God for this opportunity to share a gospel message with each and every one of you. Um, this week we've been tasked with presenting real life encounters with Jesus as recorded in the gospels. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at an encounter that was uh, recorded by Matthew. And it's a, a story that we're all familiar with, uh, Jesus is walking on the water. And each one of these encounters that we're going to be looking at is an opportunity for someone to respond to the gospel message and recognize that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. This evening, we'll be looking at Jesus's encounter on the water with his disciples in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. And we'll be using the uh, New King James Version this evening. And we're all familiar with this in story. Um, the miracle of Jesus walking on the water appears in three of the four Gospels. Uh, we see it in Matthew, we see it in John's Gospel, and Mark also recorded it. However, when you look at the three accounts of Jesus walking on the water, it's interesting to see that only Matthew was the only one who recorded the fact that Peter also walked on water. And this miracle occurs immediately after Jesus' miracle of feeding the 5,000. Now, the Bible tells us that um, there were a multitude of people, over 5,000 men, plus women and children. And Jesus fed all of these individuals with just two fish and five loaves of bread. In fact, the disciples uh, participated in this miracle, and they were the ones that handed out the bread and the fish to feed the crowd. And so at the end of the day, once everybody had dined and dined sufficiently, there were 12 baskets of food left over. And although the disciples were active participants in this miracle, they didn't fully grasp what was happening. They didn't fully understand that this was a miracle being performed by the Son of God or the Messiah. And so it was the miracle of Jesus walking on water that more than any other miracle that Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples that convinced them that he is the Son of God. And so I think it's, it's easy to condemn or to criticize the disciples um, because they had been with Jesus for so long and they didn't fully understand who he was. Uh, some of them didn't really fully understand until after Jesus had ascended to heaven and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Um, but we don't want to criticize them for the lack of understanding because even though they at that point did not have the Holy Spirit to guide them, uh, into the realization that Jesus was the Son of God, uh, we as Christians who are indwelled with the Holy Spirit oftentimes fail to recognize God's work in our lives. And so when you start to look at the lesson text, um, reading it in its entirety, again, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, uh, coming from the New King James Version. And it reads, immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the winds were contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. 
And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. And so we're going to dissect uh, these verses of scripture this evening and so that we can see the evidence that the um, disciples saw that evening on that faithful night on the Sea of Galilee uh, when they came to the realization that Jesus was in fact and still is the Son of God. And so examining the text, uh, verse 22, again, immediately Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go to the other side. And it also tells us that they sent the multitudes away. And when you read the Gospel of John, God, John explains why Jesus was in such a hurry to send the multitudes away and to send the disciples back to the boat. Uh, John tells us that the crowd wanted to make Jesus king. And not because they saw him as king of king and lord of lords, and not because he was the son of God, but because of the great things that he did, because of the miraculous things that, the, that Jesus was doing. And quite frankly, because he had just fed 5,000 people, uh, there were 5,000 people plus that got a free meal. And so their motives were not spiritual at all, and their actions obviously were not the will of God. And so Jesus uh, knew that his time had not come, and he also was concerned that if the disciples had stayed, they might have gotten caught up in the actions of the crowd. And so Jesus sent the crowds away, and then he sent the multitudes away. Verse 23 and 24 tells us that after he sent the multitude away, uh, he went up, as he often did, to the mountain to pray by himself. And he prayed there until evening by himself. But the disciples had gone ahead, and the disciples, it tells us in verse 24, that the boat was out in the middle of the uh, Sea of Galilee, and it was stalled, if you will, it was being tossed by the waves, uh, for the wind was contrary, the wind was fierce. Uh, there was a fierce storm going on. And so Jesus sent them into a storm. Um, and we obviously know that Jesus did this for a reason. Um, it wasn't, the storm didn't just appear by happenstance. Uh, it was divinely um, brought about uh, by Jesus and by God the Father. Uh, because he wanted, Jesus wanted to test the faith of his disciples, and he also wanted to teach them and reveal himself to him, to them, rather, as the Son of God. And so when Jesus was praying, he was not only communing with the Father, but he was also praying that his disciples would fare well during the test. When you read, again, the, the three different gospel accounts of this same uh, miracle, this same event, now John's gospel tells us that the boat was over three miles off the shore uh, by the time that Jesus began his walk. And Mark's version of the gospel tells us that from the vantage point where Jesus was praying, he could look out and in the moonlight of the night, uh, he could see that the disciples were in distress. He could see that these men had been rowing all night long, and because they were rowing into the wind, uh, they really hadn't made much progress. They really had not had much success. And so uh, verse 25 tells us that in the fourth watch of the night, uh, the fourth watch, this was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. And so if Jesus sent his disciples uh, on the boat at nightfall, uh, these men had been rowing for several hours, and obviously they were tired, um, they were concerned, and the fact that they had not gotten very far um, tells you two things. First of all, um, if you look at the, the resumes of these disciples, we know that several of them were fishermen. Uh, we know for a fact that Peter and, and John and his brother James were fishermen. 
And so these, these men were not unaccustomed to dealing with storms. But the fact that they were unable to prevail against this storm tells us that it was no ordinary storm. And the fact that it was uh, 3 o'clock in the morning or between the hours of 3 and 6 a.m., Mark tells us in his gospel that it was still dark outside. And so now you have a group of very tired men um, that have been battling this storm all night and really had not made much progress as far as getting to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And next thing you know, they see Jesus walking. Now, understanding the fact that the disciples had taken the boat and Jesus had prearranged that he would meet them on the other side of the lake, um, Jesus really had no other way of getting over to the other side of the lake but to walk. Um, but obviously, this was part of his divine plan uh, in order to de demonstrate uh, who he is. Amen. And by Jesus walking on the water, uh, he demonstrated his authority over the thing that was terrifying of the disciples at that time, uh, showing that Jesus uh, had authority over, uh, over nature. Amen. And verse 26 says, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But in verse 27, Jesus says, but immediately Jesus spake to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Amen. And so Jesus is walking across uh, the, the water at night. If you kind of uh, imagine this scene playing out, uh, these men, these experienced uh, fishermen uh, who had been rowing all night, who were physically exhausted and probably mentally exhausted, um, the fact that Mark sets the scene and saying that it was extremely dark out. And in the middle of the night, out of nowhere, uh, they see someone, they see a figure walking across the water. Um, again, looking at Jesus, but not looking at him with spiritual eyes, but looking at this individual who they did not realize was Jesus yet, but looking at him with physical eyes. And at that particular time, being in the physical and mental state that they were in, um, obviously we can tell from verse 26 that their mind and their imaginations got the best of them, thinking that it was a ghost. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer, do not be afraid, for it is I. And then Peter, um, we know Peter as being one who was not afraid to uh, take the lead. In fact, Peter was the leader of the disciples, if you will. And we know from our various studies and reading the Bible that Peter often got himself in trouble uh, with his mouth, uh, oftentimes speaking before he thought. And so it's easy to look at this particular situation and think this is another one of those situations. But um, in a moment, I'm going to kind of give you a different spin on Peter's uh, situation here. But verse 28 says that Peter announced, I'm sorry, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And so again, Peter was one of the boldest disciples. And, you know, when you think about Peter, Peter said things that the other disciples probably only thought. Um, he did things that the other disciples probably didn't have the nerve to do. But one thing about Peter, Peter was completely devoted to Jesus. Um, and he wanted to follow Jesus with all his heart and with all his mind. Uh, but this didn't make him um, immune from making mistakes, uh, just like the rest of us. And so, you know, Peter was the first one to speak up and say, Lord, if it's you, um, invite me out to the water. Uh, allow me to walk on the water with you. And, you know, the Bible does not record in either one of the accounts, uh, be it John, uh, be it um, Luke, or be it uh, Matthew's account, uh, none of them say that the other disciples said anything. And so we can only imagine that the other disciples uh, didn't really know what was going on. Um, you have to believe that some of them were still terrified and some of them were probably still holding on to the size of the boat for dear life. And so I, I bring that up as to say that it took one courage for Peter to um, speak up and say, Lord, if it's you, 
commanded me to come to you on the water. And secondly, it, it has to do with his faith. Um, although we know that Jesus often accused his disciples or pointed out to his disciples that they had little faith, um, this was an opportunity for Peter to step up, and he did. And he was the only one who was bold enough. He was the only one that had enough faith to step outside the boat based on uh, the command of Jesus. I think the other thing Peter wanted to find out here was he wanted proof that Jesus was the Son of God. And so if Peter was, in fact, looking for proof, um, his request to Jesus uh, did not anger Jesus. Uh, Jesus was fine with Peter asking him to you know, come out and walk with him. And so Jesus simply responded with the word, come. And so Peter steps out of the boat and he begins walking on water to go to Jesus. But verse 30, when he saw that the wind was boisterous, meaning that, that the waves were high and the wind was, um, was extremely strong and blowing hard, it says that he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And so while Peter had enough faith to step outside of the boat in the dark, uh, the wind was whipping up waves. The wind was blowing in his face. And initially Peter stepped outside the boat and his eyes were fixed on Jesus. And as long as his eyes were fixed on Jesus, he, he wasn't concerned about the winds or the waves. Uh, because he had faith that Jesus would not allow him to sink. And so this does show us at that particular moment in time that Peter's faith was relatively strong in Jesus. Amen. But when Jesus, when, when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, that's when he began to have problems. Uh, when he took his focus off of Jesus, um, he began to sink. And when we look at this as a real life application, um, oftentimes we get caught up in what's going on around us. We get caught up in what's going on in the world, on the news, uh, particularly in this time of COVID-19, and particularly in this time of civil unrest. And we tend to take our eyes off the Lord. And the Lord says that if we just focus on him, he says that we can do all things through him, but without him, we can do nothing. And so as long as Peter's eyes were fixed on Jesus, everything was all right. But the moment he started thinking about what he was doing, uh, the moment that he realized that, hey, I'm walking on water and I know I'm not doing this. I know it has to be the Lord doing this. Uh, but then he took his eyes off of Jesus and started looking at his surroundings. And so my brothers and sisters, every time we take our eyes off of Jesus and start getting caught up in those things going around us, uh, we too can sink. Uh, not so much physically sink, but spiritually sink. Uh, not so much drown like Peter is doing, but get caught up in things that we really have no business being caught up in. And so again, when, he, when Peter saw that the winds were boisterous, he became afraid and he began to sink. Uh, one thing else I'll give Peter credit for was that he didn't try to save himself. Uh, he had enough sense of knowing to call on the one who can save him. Uh, the only name that can save men um, or women. Amen. And so he had enough sense to call on the Lord. He said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus rushed out his hand and caught him and said, O oh, ye of little faith. Why did you doubt? And, and I like the fact that as soon as he called upon the Lord, Jesus stretched out his hand and saved him. And that's what the Bible tells us. It tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our, our heart that, that God raised him from the dead, that Jesus will save us immediately. Um, it, it's not a delayed reaction. Uh, it's not one that Jesus has to, to ponder. It's not one that, you know, you have to submit an application and, and have your character references uh, checked. Uh, Jesus will save us immediately if we just call on his name. Amen. And, and so Jesus, in this teachable moment, not so much chastising uh, Peter, but letting Peter know that this was an opportunity for him to have great faith. And he started out well, uh, but he didn't finish very well. And so um, Peter 
Peter's faith was somewhat lacking at the, at the time, at the moment of truth, if you will. And so Jesus stretches out his hand and catches him and says, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? I had you. And, and, and that's oftentimes God has that conversations with us. Oftentimes Jesus will approach us and say, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Uh, haven't you seen me um, help you do things successfully in your life time and time again? Um, haven't I always been there for you? Uh, haven't I always been right there by your side? And I, you would open doors that no man can shut and I can close windows that no man can open. And so sometimes we're like Peter and we have little faith. Sometimes we allow do doubt uh, to enter into our mind. And so the Bible tells us that in verse 32, that the moment they got in the boat, the wind stopped. And then finally in verse 33, this is when it all hit home. This is that light bulb moment. This is that epiphany moment for the um, disciples. And it says that then those who were in the boat, being the disciples, came and worshiped Jesus, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. And so we don't know how many miracles the disciples had seen up until this point, uh, but this was the defining moment for them when it finally clicked and they recognized that Jesus was more than just a special prophet, that Jesus was more than just a, a great preacher, uh, that he was more than just someone who could um, turn water into wine or feed over 5,000 people with two small fish and five loaves of bread, but that he was in fact the Son of God. And so when we think about all the miracles that Jesus performs in our life and recognizing that we're not always all that we should be as far as our faith goes, uh, we have to put ourselves in the same category as these disciples and recognize that Jesus truly is the Son of God. And although he has um, proven it to us time and time again, uh, first of all, through his action of salvation, but also in how he continues to intervene in our lives and, um, again, make ways out of no way for us. Um, the fact that his grace and his mercy wakes us up every morning. Uh, the fact that he provides for us. Uh, the fact that he keeps us healthy. The fact that um, we all have roofs over our heads and clothes on our back. Um, we should also fall down and worship Jesus at all times and recognize him and acknowledge him as the Son of God. And so after examining um, these verses, uh, verses 22 through 33, I want to leave you with eight key things that we have talked about and that we can glean uh, from tonight's lesson. Um, eight things. And so you have to just look back and just, again, putting yourself in the um, the shoes of the disciples, recognizing how crazy this experience must have been for them to witness. And I say crazy in such a way that it was uh, a surreal moment for them. It was a moment that they would never forget. Uh, and I'm sure that each of them that went on to preach the gospel um, often spoke of um, the miraculous things that they saw Jesus do. Uh, not to brag, but to uh, witness to others that they had in fact walked and seen uh, the Christ and that he is in fact real, okay? And so even though Peter um, had a moment where he lapsed, uh, Peter would go on to do great things uh, in spite of the criticism that, um, you know, we often put on Peter because of his actions in this particular story. And so one of the things I want to point out to you is that uh, just, like G just like Peter uh, was looking for Jesus, amen, um, we need to look for Jesus and we need to keep looking for Jesus, no matter what's going on in our life. Um, and in Peter's instances, although he was surrounded by a storm, um, he kept his eyes on Jesus initially anyway. And he only had a problem when he stopped looking at Jesus. And so the lesson is clear uh, especially when each of us live in this world or in this life where storms of life are often uh, come our way. Uh, we're often in the midst of a storm where the waters are raging, wage, raging excuse me, and the winds are blowing fiercely. Um, we should be looking for Jesus to see us through. 
uh, knowing that his promise is true, the promise that he made his disciples, that he would always be with them even till the end of time. Knowing that that same promise holds true for us, um, we should constantly be looking for Jesus. And so what does looking for Jesus look like to you? Um, that's something that you have to answer on your own. Uh, number two, when Jesus commands us, we ought to obey him. And so, again, Jesus told Peter to come. It's very simple. He didn't give Peter a whole lot of instructions. Um, he didn't tell Peter to put on his life vest. He simply said, come. Peter said, Lord, command me to come out there with you. And Jesus said, come. And so Peter started walking on water based on a simple command. Uh, he was obedient to Jesus. And so even though it didn't make sense to Peter, um, it didn't make sense that he, a mere man, would be able to walk on water, um, Peter demonstrated what obedience looks like. And that is simply doing what Jesus tells us to do. No matter how outlandish it might seem, uh, no matter how improbable it might seem, um, he, he, Peter gave us an example of what obedience looks like. And so I ask you to really examine yourself and ask yourself the question, is there any area in your life that you're not obeying God? Um, I think each of us can answer yes to that question. Third, faith is simply taking that next step. Um, and Peter took one step to get out of the boat and onto the water. And again, Peter was doing fine as long as he was focused on Jesus and that next step that Jesus was going to allow him to take. Uh, but once he lost step of that next sight, I'm sorry, once he lost sight of that next step, rather, uh, once he took his eyes off of Jesus and, and his focus uh, went off of Jesus and went on to his surroundings, that's when he got in trouble. And so, again, going through a little self-examination for each of us, and I, I count myself among you, um, what next step has Jesus asked you to take? And, and what is our excuses for not taking it? And then fourth, faith unleashes the supernatural. Uh, Peter did not experience the supernatural power of Jesus um, that allowed he walked, allowed him to walk on water until he trusted Jesus, until he had faith. And, and again, we say, well, he, he stumbled and he fell and he began to sink. Yeah, but he demonstrated faith through his initial action of asking Jesus to uh, call him out to the lake, and then the fact that he willingly stepped out. Jesus didn't make him step outside the boat. He didn't coerce Peter to step outside the boat. Uh, Peter stepped out on faith, amen. And again, I remind you, there were 11 other men uh, who were still glued to their seats in the boat and weren't even thinking about stepping out. And so faith can unleash the supernatural. Um, and so we think about our, ourselves again. Think about our, our life. Think about your life. Um, is there anything that you need to be doing differently in faith? Is there anything where um, we're showing a lack of faith, where uh, Jesus is unable to use us um, because uh, we're unwilling to step out on faith? And it doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus is going to allow us to walk on water, um, but I think there are some of us who are listening to this this evening have experienced supernatural uh, blessings uh, from God and from uh, Jesus, the Son. Um, you know, just the fact that we wake up every morning is a miracle. Um, but those of us that have, um, you know, recovered from sickness when the doctors told you there's nothing they can do, uh, those of us who have beat the odds in more ways than one, uh, because of uh, Jesus and his uh, divine blessings on our life. Recognize that this is all brought about uh, by our faith, and then our faith hopefully is being made stronger um, by those things that Jesus does. Amen. And so point number five I want to make, our fear will sink us. Uh, when Peter had faith, he walked on water. When he had fear, he began to sink in the water. And the same is true for us. Um, no matter what we're going through in life, no matter what challenges, what difficulties we might endure um, or encounter rather, it doesn't matter whether it's on the job um, or in public or even in the church, our fear will sink us every time. 
And so the question is, is there any fear that's controlling our decision making? Is there any fear in our lives that's holding us back? And then next, Jesus saves us from many things. And so just like Peter, uh, Jesus has saved us from hell. Um, you know, we, our, 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 our destination in heaven is assured. Uh, Jesus told us and tells us in John chapter 14 uh, that you know, if we believe in God, that we should believe in him. And the fact that his father's house has many mansions and there is a room, there's a reservation made for each one of us in heaven. Amen. And so Jesus has saved us from hell. Uh, but on, and he saved Peter from hell, but on this particular occasion, he also saved Peter from drowning. And so sometimes I think it's important that we step back and, and kind of think about the things that Jesus has saved us from, and that we ought to praise and worship him just like the disciples did in verse 33. Um, the third bullet on this page, a little faith is better than no faith. And so Jesus spoke of Peter's little faith when they got back in the boat. And so what, P, what, Paul, what, what Jesus was telling Peter was that, uh, and again, he wasn't so much chastising Peter, but just encouraging Peter to uh, grow in faith, uh, to have more faith. Because uh, Jesus recognized that, and Peter would soon recognize or would eventually recognize that Jesus had great plans for him. And he knew that Peter was capable of doing greater things, but in order for him to do those greater things, he had to have greater faith. And again, reminding you that the other 11 disciples um, sat in the boat, uh, clearly demonstrating where their faith was. And so I ask you, and I ask myself the same question, what is the condition of your faith? Um, do we have great faith? Or are there opportunities for us to have even greater faith? And then finally, uh, something that pastor tells us all the time, uh, but a little, with a little extra twist or a little different twist, you can choose to worry or you can choose to worship. And so in an instant, uh, the men went from worrying about their circumstances to worshiping Christ. In an instance, they went from being terrified about being capsized to being terrified because they saw what they thought was a, a ghost or a spirit to praising God, uh, to praising and worshiping Jesus as the Son of God. And so the last question I leave you with this evening is, how is our worship of the Lord going? Uh, in what areas can we improve in how we worship Jesus? Um, in what ways can we increase our faith? Um, so greater faith uh, should lead to greater service for our Lord. And so I thank each and every one of you for this opportunity to be with you this evening. Um, I pray that you got something, uh, anything out of this lesson. Uh, even if it was one little thing, um, I thank God. Uh, for this opportunity. And so with that, I wish each of one of you to have a great night. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name, uh, to study your word, Father, that we might learn more about you and that we might learn more about your son, Jesus. For Father, we know that our goal and our objective as Christians is to become Christ-like in all that we are and how we act and how we operate on a daily basis. And so, Father, we just thank you right now uh, for sending your son to die on the cross for us, Lord, that um, we would become his disciples um, and that we might have a right to the tree of life. And then, Father, we even thank you for the example of Peter. Uh, we thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, see the good things that he did, uh, the fact that he had the faith and the courage uh, to step out on faith, Lord. But then like all men, and ourselves included, that he faltered. But Father, we're so grateful, and we just praise you and thank you right now, Lord, that when we falter, uh, you don't leave us alone. You don't leave us to our own devices, Father, but that you reach out and you grab us and you save us and you lift us up and you place us back on 
solid ground. And so, Father, we just thank you right now, Lord. Father, we ask you to help us to continue to uh, grow closer to you. We ask you to help us to continue to strengthen our faith. Lord, Father, we ask you to help us to be better disciples. And then, Father, we ask you that we might be uh, better ambassadors for you, Father, that we might take this lesson, Lord, and that we might go out and share it with somebody else. So, Father, we just thank you right now for how you continue to sustain us. We thank you for how you continue to bless us. Father, right now we lift up this uh, vacation Bible study. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for our superintendent. Lord, we thank you for all the teachers who thought it not robbery uh, to make this happen, even in the midst of this pandemic. We thank you for the technology. We thank you for the means that we can communicate uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. Uh, even during situations when we're homebound. Even though we're not together physically, Father, uh, we, we pray that we will continue to unite in spirit. And then and always, we'll be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise that's yours and yours alone. It's in the matchless and majestic name of Jesus the Christ that we pray. I'll let everyone say amen. Pilgrim, thank you very much. I love you, and I hope to see you all again sometime very soon. Take care. And God bless you.